Hey guys, how's it going here? It's the team at Authentic Mission and today we want to do a interview with a fun guy uh, we've honestly never uh, met in person yet but uh, we wanted to get the message out about the Libertarian Party up in BC and we are speaking with one of their candidates and he is... I am Keith Colmar. I am the candidate in Kootenai East for the BC Libertarian Party. All right, cool. So, uh, question number one that's always on everybody's mind, especially, in all honesty, since the election with the Oompa Loompa in the United States, uh, what is the Libertarian Party, uh, at least provincially, in Canada? Well, here in BC, we've... We are under the, the biggest socialistic state uh, of all the provinces. We have three parties running that are, we call them the big three in BC. Mm -hmm. It's the uh, the NDP, the, the BC Liberals, and the Greens. So you have left, lefter, and leftist. And there's no economic responsibility out here. So the libertarian movement in BC is about the, the fiscal responsibility and, uh, you know, the socially accepting side of, of libertarianism as well. We're, we're that answer out here to conservatism that has never caught on in BC because of the, uh, the the social aspect. The social conservatism doesn't work in BC. All right, cool. Um, so, um, well, I guess we could start with a little bit of background for you. Like, how long have you been involved with the Libertarian uh, Party, and what brought you to it? Uh, so, I started researching libertarianism and we kind of just stumbled across it uh, through the american elections in 08 in 2012. Um, i'm a ron paul uh, fan I, I followed him and, and and watched his career and, and from that I, I got an understanding of libertarianism and, and the essence of unethical force initiated on another person and, and it made sense to me so from that around 20 late 2014 early 2015 i found tim moen on the internet and uh as the federal leader of the, of the uh, Libertarian Party of Canada, he is just an awesome ambassador. And I fell in love with him and the message. And from that, I joined the federal party and I became the regional coordinator for BC. So after we decided to do that and I was, I was going in full, full blown with the federal party, we had an election coming up in 2017 in BC. And we really didn't have a present, presence provincially. So I decided that it would be my mission to join the provincial party, get onto the board, and, and, and give it some life, put some paddles on the party, and, and, and give us a presence out here. And between myself and the leader, Clayton Wallwood, and I also want to throw a shout-out to Kyle McCormick. He's our, our internet guy. He fixed our webpage and, and made us relevant again. Um, between the three of us and, and a few new additions, we've really sparked some life in, in, in the message of liberty here in B.C. Mm. Now, um, I, li uh, I live in Ontario, and the team the authentic mission team is out here in Ontario. So I know a little bit about the Ontario platform, but what's on the, for any of the listeners or, or uh, watchers of this uh, YouTube video, what is on the BC uh, Libertarian uh, platform? Uh, we were calling it the platform of choice. Basically what we're asking is that the, the, the province allow private competition to come back in against all of these different government monopolies we have in BC. That's that's probably the, the, the biggest thing on our, our platform is in our province we have government run insurance, we have government run energy, we have uh, government run uh, you know risk insurance for businesses, uh, our liquor board is controlled by the province and there is no competition so we're we want to introduce competition back in those markets. Then in education, we want to do choice again. We want voucher systems for our education out here. We see that $10,000 a child would be a great start to putting money back in the hands of parents and, and giving them some, uh, some leeway in how their children are educated and allow teachers also to innovate. Uh, the healthcare system, the same. We have, we have a big, long, straight line in, in our healthcare system in Canada. Mm -hmm. um, Alan Small ad adopted one of my quotes and it is that socialism doesn't show up in Canada in, in, our, in our grocery stores. It shows up in our hospitals and in our doctor's offices. Mm -hmm. And if Canadians really want to have an example of what socialism looks like, it's the long straight line at the hospital where it takes so long to get proper care. So we want choice across the board, and, and that's really what our platform is about. It's, it's, instead of standing in the end zone and saying we want everything privatized tomorrow, 
we're walking across that field and we're taking the hands of the statists and saying, let's let's introduce some choice and let's let's get a little bit of freedom back and see how that feels and then move from there. Yeah. So um, how big are your poll numbers growing out there? Are are you guys growing or are you at a uh, a comfortable position right now or are you shrinking a little bit? Just just wondering. Uh, so a, a they don't poll libertarians. It's funny. Mm -hmm. they, they, they're polling four parties right now in the polls. They're asking about the uh, BC Liberals, the NDP, the Green, and the Conservative Party of BC. They're running 10 candidates. They have no leader. We're running 30 candidates. We have a leader. We're strong on the ground. They're not even asking the question in, in the polls. So, of course, as everything else, there's a huge media blackout against libertarians. Which is why but I want to do this. We're, we're fighting against this, though, and, and we're, we're trying to get the word out. But uh, the, the interesting statistic for me is that in the last 10 days, the other has jumped from negligible to about 6%. And I think that's a big spike in people who are voting Libertarian. And, and, and we have no accurate uh, data to represent that being for us. But I really think that that's a spike in, 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 our, in, in people who are saying, no, we're, we're voting for somebody else this election. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you the same thing I asked uh, Mr. Small when I did the last uh, Libertarian interview. Um, do you believe that the United States and even to some sense, uh, well, of course in some sense Canada, would you say that uh, the whole thing with Trump has made Libertarianism grow or, or just the status quo is getting people fed up, or what would you say? That, that is a really interesting question, and, and, and as to why libertarianism is growing. And, and now you see it in the conservative, the federal conservatives, Bernier is, is on fire, and O'Leary has dropped out and thrown his support behind him, so you do see this huge movement of libertarianism. But I think it's bigger than just Trump. I, I think it was happening before Trump. I, I really believe that the message that Ron Paul started in 2008 was just like a pebble in the water, and that 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 staunch defender of, of liberty and freedoms has caught on and and people are just so tired of the status quo that they're looking for anything else and i know in bc right now the reason that they're there that we're coming up at the table is they do not want to vote for the liberals again and they cannot vote for the ndp mm -hmm. and that's then that's what they see on, on the ballot so the choice then becomes in these 30 ridings where we are libertarianism versus the Green Party, which is even more state than they're already sick of. Yeah. And I think that's really what's happening in BC here and why it's rising. But as a nation, I just really think we're fed up with of being infringed and that, that pebble in the pond in the state started the conversation and people are catching on to it. Mm -hmm. So um, one thing I have to ask, because uh, I'm, I'm disabled and so are in the past, so were some members of my team. So... I like libertarianism for the reasons that you just said. The status quo, I'm fed up with it. I'm learning that there's more to just to there's more to politics than just two or three parties. So that's what got me interested in it. But the one thing that does concern me, or maybe I'm misunderstanding it, and I keep asking people this uh, just for people like me. Generally, when you see stuff about libertarianism, uh, I've personally done videos saying, how are we going to, yes, we want less government involvement, but we still need to help people on uh, disability, uh, such as myself, so we can get off disability and quit wasting taxpayers, or not wasting, but at least using taxpayers' money. So, I I know how it works for disability in uh uh, in Ontario, but how does it work for disability in BC, and what's the BC party's standpoint on disability? Uh, and I love this, Stephen, because again, the, the, the biggest rap on libertarians is that we just want to go into government, burn it down, and walk away, and, and, and let people deal with the rubble. And, and, and there are a lot of libertarians out there who, who honestly believe that, Stephen, that we would be better without government. Yeah. So now I'm a minarchist. I'm, I'm somewhere who sits in the middle, and I believe that 
Although government should be very small, it should be on the things that it needs to be involved, it needs to be focused and very robust. Because there's no point in involving government in something and doing it half-heartedly. You're, you're, you're wasting taxpayers' dollars when you do these things half-heartedly. Yeah. So what we've seen develop in Canada now is the state that wants to do, be all things for all people. And it gets nothing accomplished because it's spread out too thin. It's no different than any military that ever tried to conquer the world or, or any other situation like that. In the macro, it doesn't work. It has to be in the micro. So what we need to do in, 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 in every situation of government is find out where we're going to involve ourselves and then really inject ourselves at a robust level. So what I'm the conversation I've started with disability in BC is that there's more than just physical disability. There's mental disability and there's also economic disability. And at the end of the day, we should be empowering all three of these groups to get back to a point where they not only feel good about themselves, but they're contributing to their own lives and to society again. Yeah. So what, what, what I would like to do, Stephen, to, to address this is we want to start up a Ministry of Disability Empowerment in BC. And what that would do is that would remove the state from all of these other places. There would be no more welfare. There would be no more of these other programs that are set up. And it would all be encompassed under this one ministry to empower people. And from that, what we would do is we would... Right now in BC, you get about $1,000. I think it's 1068 a month on disability. Yeah. It's terrible that people try to have to live on this. And yet so the housing like market... Be... Sorry. No, go I, ahead. I was just going to say, and yet the housing market's at a total... Yeesh. Oh, at the other end of the scale, we're paying thirteen, fourteen hundred dollars a month rent for like the top of a house here in BC. Real estate is just ridiculous. So these yeah. people on disability... They can't even live on their own. At best, they're their they're in-laws or a friend. They're sharing apartments. It, it's no way to live. And it's, it's not even, we can't pretend anymore that this is a living wage and that we're actually taking care of these people. Mm. We're not. We're not helping disability at all. It's, it's, it's a program of enslavement. It is not a program of empowerment. There's nothing there. There's no education programs. There's nothing to get you back working. So under this new ministry that we want to start, we want to put it on. Basically, we want to set the ticker on four years and, and, and aim for getting people back to work within that four-year program because we think that that's a, like, that's a full university degree. If, if, you can, if you can empower people to get back to, to school or to educate themselves or to pick up some type of trade where they're, they're working in, in an office, yeah. that's the best way to do this. So you, you, you front-end heavy load this program with money, and in the long term, it pays off because these people are no longer on the system. And I want to also reiterate that there has to be some type of stipulation put in there that if these people become disabled to the point again where they can no longer work or participate at what we've done, you yeah. have to start that process over again. It has to be very forgiving and very open to make sure that these people are working. Yeah. And I think also if you focused it like that, you would get a lot of the waste gone and you would have a lot more people in positions who are caring and involved and they would catch a lot of the fraud and abuse that happens. And I really don't think there's a lot. I think it's one in a thousand, if that, that, that are that are mucking with the system. And it gives it a bad name for everybody else. And it becomes this punitive attack on everyone, as opposed to this empowerment system that we should have. Yeah. I, I like your, um, I like personally, I, I got to say, I like your stance on it. I like that. Because, and I don't, again, freedom of speech, but I've tried to say, uh, that we need to help people with disability and other libertarians under under their own opinion, which is fine, have told me basically. Uh, I'm paraphrasing, but they're like, "No, nope, uh, you're not." I've been told I'm not a libertarian if I feel that way, and it's like, no, no, you don't have to. Let's let's clarify for anybody that's considering libertarianism, you don't have to be 100% a conservative, 100% a libertarian. That's what makes us individual, you know what I mean? So Exactly, and, and within the movement of libertarianism, all people should understand that it really doesn't matter where we line up ide ideologically on the left or the right. There are collective libertarians and there are individualist libertarians. The, the question is about where we swing the hammer of government at people. Yeah. Where are we willing to use force to enable this, the system to thrive? And the more and more we use this hammer, the thicker it gets, and the more people want to control it. So if we shrink it down and make it what it actually is supposed to be, which is a system of empowering people, 
and then creating equity and opportunity, it, it, it loses that value. There, there isn't enough government there for people to take power and have control. Mm -hmm. So that's ultimately what, what libertarians need to be talking about. And I get that same argument, Stephen. I, I'm, I'm fighting hard inside it that there, that, that there has to be this conversation of compassion and there has to be that minimum social net. We're, we're never going to go to zero government. We're never going to go to a place where there is no social net. We're, we're beyond that as humans. There's, and, and everybody's willing to contribute to this. I have yet to have one conservative person look at me and say, I don't want a social net. What I hear is I'm tired of the system bleeding me dry. Yeah. And we see it with our, with our health care. We see it with our education system. We see it with all of these big government programs. They're huge furnaces. And it's like you're shoveling money inside of them. And the bureaucracy has gotten so large that you can't even keep track of it. So that's what we need to dial back. We don't need to dial back the front end care. We need to dial it back the back end waste administration. Mm. Um, actually, you bring up a good point. And I've struggled with education, uh, being that I have a learning disability, a developmental disability, and vision impairments, and anxiety and depression. Because I've had teachers tell me, you won't be able to be a filmmaker. You, your English is horrible. Blah, 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 blah. So how would you guys exactly, like, I've been wondering or trying to grow my expectation or grow my opinion on, uh, on education. Like, w uh, would you support something, would the libertarian support something where it's more individual learning based? Of course. That, that's what we're pushing here in BC. We want, we want the teachers who, who understand these learning disabilities and these, these problems to open up schools that are, that are uh, tailored to these people. Yeah. So that they can provide that proper education. Here's, here's, here's what I see for, for a, a working education system. I see communities who no longer have the administration of the school board to worry about. The, yeah. the, the government isn't involved in that. What you have is local teachers who say, you know what, there's, there's 35 children in this town with this certain type of disability and I'm trained to teach them. Yeah. So they're going to open up that school and they're going to hire a couple of teachers to help them and they're going to look after those 35 students. They're going to get specialized care and they're, and they're going to be looked after well. So with our $10,000 voucher system on 35 students, that's $350,000. She's going to be able to pay her teachers $100,000 a year and put herself in a facility and still make $100,000 a year herself. Yeah. And have all of the amenities that these, that these students need. Mm-hmm. Sounds Whereas great. right now it's all administrative and it's one size fits all. Yeah. So we, we, we know that the market will solve itself in every little community if it's just empowered to, to, to do these things. So if this, is, this needs to be ground up instead of top down. We yeah. can't legislate these, these, these solutions, but we can open up the market to fix them. Yeah. And then I know that the teachers in their heart want to give this care. They want to, they want to teach these students the, the way they feel in their heart, but they're, they're handcuffed by the government. Yeah. It has to be a certain way, and it, it comes down, and it's only dribbled money at them. And so they're hand, they have no ability to actually teach. And if we just got out of their way, I know they would do the, the job that they want to. And, and students like yourself would respond to that. They'd be empowered. And we'd see a whole different organization happening in our society. Yeah, I would even say it applies to kids with, uh, to, uh, with kids um, that have ADD. Because if they're active... Give them something active to do to learn their math. Like, tell them, okay, you know, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, but, I mean, I just think there's not enough individual lesson plans. They say they have them, but they're not there. So. Well, they're, 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 it's, it, the problem is everything comes down as a one-size-fits-all edict. They all have to fit within a certain type of framework. Yeah. And, and when, when, you're, when you're talking from the top down, you're not allowing for that innovation to happen. So in their own minds, yes, they're, they're, they're allowing for this choice, they're allowing for it to happen, but it's still within a certain framework. And if you organize from the bottom up, that framework disappears and it becomes so fluid that literally there'll be towns where they teach how to ice fish because that's how they live up there. Yeah. And there'll be towns that teach you how to play ice hockey because that's what everybody does. And there'll be towns that have like these these uh, how to run a combine and how to work the field and how to till the till the, the, the crop under. Yeah. 
because of where you live and then the knowledge that you need to be an economic viable person in that area yeah and 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 again it all comes down from us trying to make everybody all of these round pegs fit into square holes um very true i um i would like to ask you actually uh something that's been popping up on the news there's two things that have been on the news within the past little while that like you're your um, opinion on one would be the, uh, and I think it's more on the federal side, but it will trickle down to provincial, I believe. So uh, if I'm wrong, just tell me if I'm wrong. But the yep. the uh, free the beer try uh, case with the Supreme Court. Do you know? Yes. Yeah. Uh, what what do I'm you following? I'm, I'm following that. Yeah. What's your stance on that? Like I know what mine is. My opinion. If it's within our country, I don't know why that guy had any problems. And um, actually, if anybody's listening to this video and they don't understand what we're talking about, do you want to briefly explain it and then tell me your opinion on it? Well, it's it, it's it's the guy buying the beer in in uh, either New Brunswick and taking it to Quebec or buying it in Quebec and taking it back to New Brunswick. If I'm correct, yeah. Uh, he's he's transporting beer across a provincial line and he's getting a charge for it. So how, how ridiculous have our regulations become now that we want to force people to pay local taxes? Because really that, that's what the question is here is they, they, the province has a certain tax on their beer and they don't want you going into the other province to pay that province the taxes so that you can drink cheaper beer. It's, it's East Germany. Yeah. They, they, built, they built a wall and they surrounded it because of beer and now every time you go across the border and try to get free beer, you get shot. Yeah. So it's, it's 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 absolutely ridiculous. These 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 are the reasons that led that uh, lead to people becoming libertarians. It's it's ridiculous. It's it's a waste of legislation. It's a waste of court time. There's people who are murdering and raping, and there's people who are human trafficking. And here we do we have this guy in court, and we're arguing over whether he can drive beer across a, an imaginary line between two provinces. To me, it blew my mind that that when I learned that last. Uh, well, a while ago, anyway, I don't remember when. When I learned that, I was surprised that you couldn't bring something as simple as beer from one province to another. It exactly. Mind. It makes no sense. I could see, hypothetic, hypothetically, maybe other countries, but even then, you're allowed to bring stuff back from Cuba. I was going to say that we can go to the duty-free when we're coming back from the U.S. and we can buy all the tax-free beer that we want. Yeah. There's, there's, well, not all. Let, let me rephrase that. There's a limit. They're not going to let you fill your van with, with flats of beer and not pay tax on it. But you can go down and you can buy yourself a 60 of, of vodka and a case of beer and bring it home and have no problem. So if you can if you can cross a, 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 like a, a government line, like a federal <laughs> And do that and have no problems. Why is it illegal to do it across a provincial line that's supposed, supposed to be less patrolled? Yeah, makes no sense. It's a, exactly. And the other thing I wanted to ask you, and I think I believe you alluded to it earlier, but the the gentleman that I believe it's a doctor is currently going about the Supreme Court or the BC Supreme Court. For something to do with medical and, and wait lists and stuff like that. Uh, I can't think of his name right now, but he... Do you, do you know what I'm referring to? No, I'm not I'm not too sure of what you're talking about. Or is this a, a cannabis issue here? Because no. there's a lot of those going on? Or No, no, like it's, I'm, it's I'm a guy that... Follow. It's a doctor that wants to create a system kind of like the U.S. And he was... He's saying... He's bringing... The BC Supreme Court, or he's bringing the case to the BC Supreme Court. Oh, okay, yes, yes, I'm, I'm following you now. He, he wants to do private practice. Yeah. And, and they're, they're saying no, you can't do private practice. You have to, you have to stay within the constraints of the public medical system. I don't see why um, we can't do both. Well, and again, he should be allowed to. Well, who are we to, yeah. uh, to dictate how he can dole out medicine to people? And, and since when did we ever control labor like that? We. We rail against that in Canada. That's why we have unions. We we rail against price controls on wages and and telling people you know people what they're worth. 
So why why all of a sudden, because a, a doctor's supposed to be altruistically expecting to work for free? I don't expect him to work for free, nor do I expect educators to work for free. Yeah. These people, you know, they're pouring time and effort into the world. So I, I don't understand that whole mentality of why this guy has to be hammered into, you know, into your government system. It's ridiculous. And now again, we have this long, straight line of medicine in BC. And I'll give you an example of how evil it is. Yeah. You cannot go and get an MRI outside the system if you wanted one. I'm in a town right now where they don't even have an MRI machine. We have a traveling around on a trailer. It gets to town one week out of four weeks in, in a cycle, and they cycle it between three towns. One town gets it for two weeks because it's bigger than the rest. So this MRI machine travels around, and we wait eight to nine months to get care. And now if you hurt yourself and you go to work, say, see here in town, and they need that examination right away, they send you four and a half hours to Calgary and they pay for it. And your tax dollars in BC pay for him to jump the line, but you're not allowed with your own money to jump that line. Mm -hmm. How does that make any sense? Yeah, I agree. Um, so yeah, it's, it's absurd and we would we would completely stop that. You, If you want to open up your own practice, you go right ahead. And, and the libertarians believe that. And, and, and we, we don't want the public system to crumble. We want people to be cared for, but we think there's, there's better ways to do it. And by letting people actually open up these private care uh, facilities, you would see a huge increase in outcomes. And I would think less wait times, no? Oh, for sure. Even, you think of it as the border. If, you, if you're crossing the border to, uh, to America and they've only got one gate open, that's going to be a pretty big, long line staring at the Niagara Falls. But if they have eight gates open, you're going to travel through that border pretty quick. So why would medical care be any different? If, if you have different avenues to get care, the line just shrinks, and every time you open up a new avenue, the line splits again. Did, yeah. a, a good question that uh, one of our candidates raised on the debate stage was, when people look at medicine in Canada and they think of this universal health care, we really don't have it because there's a lot of medicines that aren't included under this system. Yeah. Dental, uh, Chinese therapy, chiropractic. Um, so when you look at these other ones that are free market, there's no lineup at the dentist. Mm -hmm. There's no lineup at the autometrist. There's no lineup at the chiropractor because they're free market and they compete and they have best price and everybody's, uh, you know, trying to provide outcome. Yeah. The only place we have the lineup is in the, is in the public system. Now, I noticed, uh, and by the way, everything you've said lately or so far is, is right. And uh, I've never had, uh, besides uh, an interview with uh, you and... Uh, and um, you and Mr. Uh, 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 Small, you guys are putting it uh, the right way. You know what I mean? You guys are making it nice and simple for listeners, which is good. Because I find um, other, other politicians tend to talk to the point where you're like, wait, what did, in the long run, you're going, wait, what did they say? Because they talk so fast, you're like, huh? <laughs> well, and, and, and the biggest problem I find with politicians is they, they even in their, even the good, the good ones, the ones that want to do good and be good and, 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 and represent the people, they end up falling into this trap of trying to be all things for all people, and they get lost in, in the headiness of it all. Yeah. And they, 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 they talk in these big, you know, long speeches about... Um, just, just data, and especially libertarians, we don't, we don't have this interpersonal connection. And I don't know what it is about most libertarians, but they don't have that social set. I, I wish I could breed it into our, into our party, because that's really what we're lacking. The message is strong, the principles are good. It's the ability to relay it across that bridge and, and let people understand that, look, there's life situations that I can give you and show you where these problems are out, are. are cropping up in our society, mm -hmm. as opposed to just saying, no, you're wrong. I think that that's the biggest problem with, with people who are trying to promote libertarianism, is even though you know you're right, you can't stand there and point your finger at someone and tell them how wrong they are. You have to show them why. You have to, you know, give them that example in life. And, and I find that I do that fairly well, and I know Alan does it well. Yes. And I think that's where we're going to get that bridge in memory. When we all get on that message, people are going to start to come across and, and understand that, yes, almost everybody is libertarian, at least in, in some form or another. Yeah. And when we, can, when we can appeal to that, that's when we're going to start to really change hearts and minds. Yeah. Now, the other thing, before I forget, um, 
obviously this is a hot topic right now and I heard you mention something in, in an old video or not an old video but in a video I watched a couple days ago on uh, our mutual friends uh, Facebook page um, <clears throat> uh, you mentioned your message about cannabis in the video that I watched so what is your message about cannabis well, it's a strong one. I here's here's where I'm at, and I'm in BC. I'm I'm at ground zero for where the cannabis movement started. Oh yeah, we've been going BC, but it's world renowned, and we've been doing it for 50 years since the hippies started jumping trains in the 60s. We've been growing cannabis here. Mm -hmm. So now that now that we've had this war on cannabis with the government, and they've decided that they're going to give their terms of surrender, they're going to back off and 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 let us have our cannabis. They've decided that they're going to control the production of it. And they're going to give us all these other little rules that we're going to fight about, like four plants and 100 centimeters and all of the junk that shouldn't be on the table anyways and we shouldn't really be fighting about. That's where they're trying to direct this fight. And they don't want us to talk about who is growing the plant. Yeah. And they're setting up right now this fascist dictatorship over the cannabis industry yeah. that's owned and operated by the Liberal Party of Canada. Yep. And they're, they're crushing all of the small little operations that are going on in BC. And I have a warning out there for anybody who's who, who's playing in this game. When July 8, 2018 comes and the federal government actually rolls out the Cannabis Act, the they're going to have to they they punch you out of where you are. Pardon? Sorry? I said they're, it, when 2018 comes, July 2018... Anybody who's growing cannabis right now or playing in that game and trying to live in the gray is going to be in trouble because they're going to actually have walking papers to take these people out. You're going to have an act that is solid and ready to go. And these guys are going to start getting 14 years. So this game is over. They're, they're, they're pushing out these growers and they're adamant that anybody who is not a licensed producer is a criminal. Yeah. So this, this craft cannabis in BC is going to disappear if we don't stand up and say, hey, this is our industry and, and, and we should protect it. Well, so we're very strong on protecting this industry here in BC. Yes, of course. And part of me, like if I was, you know, I love where I live. I have my family, I have my supports, but I kind of wish we lived in BC because I know a lot of people, a couple of people in BC that are great people and, and, and advocates and, and, and they like to, I'm a medical user, but, uh, and I use it spiritually. I believe it was put here by God, if I can get religious for a second. But sure. uh, that's that's my stance on it. Now, the, the, the federal liberals stated, though, that they are also leaving a lot of these choices of re uh, where it can be sold, how much, the age, all of that stuff. They, they've, they've, uh, they're leaving a lot of that to the federal... Juris, I mean, provincial jurisdictions. So yes. It, hypothetically, if the Libertarians got in either at this election or the next election, you guys had to say on where it would go and where it would be sold, what would your stance be on that for anybody that's listening right now? I've been to Colorado. I, I've studied their model very well. They have plain packaging. They have um, all electronic ID systems set at the door so you can't go in unless you're over 19. The, they weigh it right in front of you. They put it on a scale. They punch in the product that you're buying. It prints out a little medical label for you that you put on the side of the, the plastic container and out you go. And it's the safest and it's the best model that I have seen yet. They only have a 10% state tax. I would like to see that in Canada if we're going to do it. Just a, a flat 10% uh, provincial tax. If the, if the federal government's going to put it all on the provinces, then that's where the money should go. They, the, the federal government shouldn't be involved in, in that. You, you're, you're putting all of the costs and all of these legislations and bylaws up on people, then, then you don't deserve any of the money. So I, I, being to Colorado, it works. Dispensaries work. People understand the product. They yeah. don't, they, they, it's, it's very focused. They're not worried about selling you anything else. They're, they're worried about giving you the best cannabis and the, the one that's going to work best for you. Okay, now what about the age? If you guys were allowed to set the age, what would the age be for you? Well, we would roll all the age across Canada back to 18. Thank you. I said the same thing a while ago in a video. Um, again, we want, we want uh, uniformity. So in BC right now, smoking and, and drinking is 19. Yeah. Until, until we... 
roll that back to 18, we would want uniformity in those three. So, of course, we would just set it up right now for 19 and, and, and roll with it. But we, we believe as a party that if the government can call on you to pick up arms and kill other people, you're pretty much an adult enough to make your choice as to whether you want to smoke a joint or have a beer or smoke a cigarette or do any of the other things that adults do. Can I you do cannot that? ask me to be a man and kill people. And, or an adult. I don't want to use man or woman because there's a lot of women in the military. Yeah. So if you're adult enough to do that for the government, the government should be adult enough to let you pick your vice. Now, uh, I can I give you another way to to say it that I think y you you uh, you would like. Sure. Uh, um, I would di like because I used to use the war argument, but nowadays I believe unless there's like a third or fourth world war or whatever, I I believe we're in a third world war already. We're just not calling it that. Um, but but uh, I would I would say that if the government expects you from the age of eighteen to pay taxes and they can collect your money, then let people do what adults are allowed to do. There you go. And that's a great argument too. That's that's the age where they say you're fully taxed now. You're you're an adult. You can you can start paying for the system that you live under. So you're right. And and again, these are all the same things. Those are adult things. You're 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 allowing people to join the military, you're allowing people to pay tax. We're well, forcing them to, to do one of those. Mm -hmm. But again, if, if you're gonna if you're gonna expect them to make adult choices and, and have to do these adult decisions, then you also have to allow them to, to live their own life. But again, here here I am. I want I want to throw that conversation of cannabis right back onto who's growing it. It yeah. doesn't matter who, who how old you are. None of none of these issues really matter if they control who's selling it. Yeah. Stephen, that's that's the that's the problem. It's it's kind of like the old Rothschild quote: "I care not." Who makes the laws? As long as I control the uh, issuance of c currency, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing with with cannabis. It doesn't matter how old you are or when you're selling it. If I'm growing it all and you're buying it from my licensed producer, I win. You can you can hand it out. You can do whatever you want with it. Yeah, I win. Yeah, I um I would say like I I like my beer. I used to drink like you wouldn't believe. But I've slowed down. I, I went through my, you know, dummy stage. Uh, yeah. But I I believe cannabis, if you're using it, uh, if you're using it, like... Responsibly. Responsibly. It's healthier than alcohol. Let's be honest. Let's miles. Be I don't drink anymore because of that. I used to have... I used to have an, an issue with alcohol. My dad's an old Croatian bricklayer, and I became a bricklayer, and it was just natural for us to grab the bottle and to dive in like everybody else. Yeah, hard so day I, work, I, crack I, beer, right? Yeah, I'm done with my vices. So the only vice I have left is cannabis. It's, it's what I use. Everybody can call me a recreational user. I've been using it for 30 years. I say there is no recreational user. We're all using it for therapeutic reasons. Thank so, you. You know, I don't. I don't want to separate the two. In my mind, I think everybody uses cannabis to relax, and then from that, we've developed other reasons for it. But ultimately, everybody who comes home at the end of the day and smokes that joint just wants to wash a little bit of the pressure of the world off. Yeah. Can I? Uh, I, I believe if if there's more if there's more you want to say, of course we can keep going. But off the top of my head, I can only think of uh, two more issues. Uh, um, if, if you want to do a follow up one, we can do a follow up one or we can keep going sure. and that's fine with me. But, um, you hear about the federal and the provincial governments trying to work together about the housing market in these major cities like Toronto, BC, Vancouver, all of this. So what would you guys do or advocate for at least as a provincial government to cool the housing market, or do you think you should just stay out of it and let it keep going the way it is? And every time the government injects itself, it, it, it causes problems. So we're, we're at a point right now where the legislations and the regulations in, in our country have caused this housing bubble. And as we mess around with it, and every time we try to do something else, we, we cause more in instability in it. In BC, I'll give you an example right now. We have... Uh, it's a huge bubble here, but we, we just implemented a 15% foreign buyer's tax. Yeah. 
on on our market. So what that's the, the, the doing that in in uh, in response to cool the market. They're trying to slow it down a bit. Mm-hmm. So on the on the other cuff, they hand they're handing out thirty seven thousand uh, dollar matching bursaries for first time home buyers. So if you are a home buyer, you've never bought a home, and you've got thirty grand, but the down payment's sixty, they'll match the thirty, give you an interest free loan over five years. Kind of like the brick does with furniture. We'll hit you at the end of it all, and we'll we'll start charging the interest when it's time, right? Yeah. So, on one hand, they're cooling the market. On the other hand, they're heating it up. They really have no clue what they're doing, and they're just causing problems. And 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 there's no investigation into what is causing this. So in Vancouver, the biggest problem is that eighty, I think it's eighty-one percent of the land is single uh, family dwellings. Yeah. And it, there's no, they're not allowing people to go up. They, they can only spread out, and you can only spread out so far in that valley before you run out of room. Yeah. So now that's what they've done. They, they've hit the stagnant edge where they can't grow anymore. And there's, there's no, the, the solution is supply. You, yeah. you need to increase the supply if you don't want a, a supply issue. And it's that simple. And then they're not talking about it. So we would deregulate. We would work on getting homes from uh, drawing board to the market a lot quicker, uh, quicker, not clicker, but a lot quicker. And we would uh, we would not have these taxes of, of foreign, foreign buyers and things like that because they just they mess with the market. Yeah. We just want to increase the supply and then the, the market will level itself off just on that alone. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I don't know much about real estate, so off the top of my head, what you've said for me with my disability makes sense. Um, the, 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 uh, the one thing is, what about these foreign buyers? Would you, would you get them out completely? Oh, no, I, I see nothing wrong with foreign buyers buying, uh, buying up housing in, in, in BC and, and doing these things. I, I don't see that as a problem. What, what I see as the problem is the devaluation of our dollar the, uh, the, the they're holding a lot of our debt, so they're actually spending American debt and Canadian debt over here. They're they're flooding our market with our with our bad currency that we've sent out. Yeah. So these issues are different. They're, it's it's not about them investing in the property. It's about what we've done to make our property so inviting to them. And then the big part of that is we we've shortened the supply and we've driven the price up. So of course the speculator wants to jump in and it just heats the market up. Yeah. If we increase supply, that would end in a, in like a day. If, there, if, if there's enough supply for everybody, there's no longer this hot market, and the foreign investors will go away. Mm-hmm. What about um, the the one thing that came up in terms of numbers and everything else uh, that really caught my attention this week was the the news saying that for the first time in Canadian history since, um, what's that word I'm looking for? Uh, Confederation, there we go. Um, For the first time ever, senior citizens are outnumbering the number of kids. So wouldn't you say that this helps prove your point or the libertarian point about healthcare? Because I can see nothing but problems with that. Well, sure, and now CPP. Here's the here's the next issue. We have a huge EI and CPP problem because what happens is is when when we hit a, a block in the market, when oil dropped from 120 to 40 bucks a barrel, all of Alberta was laid off in one shot. The whole province just got their walking papers for three or four or five months until the market figured itself out. Yeah. So this this just hit the economy so hard, it's money straight out of the taxpayer's pocket. So these these funds that, that are supposed to be nest eggs and pools of money are not. They're running out of general revenue uh, retirement funds. All of these programs have now been depleted. Mm-hmm. So we need to really rethink how we're, how we're organizing these. We want to privatize both. I would like to see, and I'll give you an example of how I want it laid out. Yeah. If you're getting $20 an hour from an employer, I want you to be able to go to the employer and say, look, I'm going to contribute. $2 an hour of that into my retirement and my EI mutual fund. And you, I would like you to match. So what they do is they now take that $4 an hour and they split it amongst either your 
EI mutual fund or your retirement mutual fund. Yep. And they're both in your control. So that when you get laid off, you can walk into the bank and bring in your ROB, and you don't have to ask the government for money. It's your own money. It's been put there, and it's and you're investing it, and you're, you're taking care of your own mutual fund. Yep. And if, and if we did that, there wouldn't be this reliance at the back end on the government. And we would have the system there to protect the people who became economic, economically disabled. Their EI is gone. Their retirement fund is depleted. They've got nothing. So then we can pick those people back up and empower them. But again, if, if we self-organize, if we put these powers back in people's hands, we don't have to look at the government and say, you wasted my money, now what do we do? Yeah. All of these people on run retirement, we're not going to be able to afford this this uh, this huge entitlement. And it's not even an entitlement. They've paid for this. Yeah. And we've squandered it as, as a society. And now we're left holding the bag for these for these elderly who, yeah. who believed in their government. So we need to protect them. But moving forward, we need to, to firm up the system so that it never happens again. Yeah, a good point. Um, now, the um, I would think the last question I want to ask you, and again, this goes to things I saw in the news. Um, I've been watching a lot about the opioid epidemic out there. Okay, yeah. like the, the the heroin or the fentanyl and all that, and it's and it's hitting Ontario. So, <clears throat> um, the ministers of provinces and I think the federals, they met up and they all discussed what to do. And I don't, of course, it all happened behind closed doors. So we probably only got like ten percent of a hundred percent conversation. Of course, right? So. I've watched a W5 story about this, and I got to tell you, it. I've seen what OxyContin does. I haven't seen what fentanyl does, but just seeing what I saw in the news, it's like, holy shit, if I can be honest. Um, so... Uh, I have great insight on this, Steve, and I, 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 I'm, I'm at ground zero. Exactly, that's why I'm asking you about it. Because Tim, so, Tim, sorry, Tim Moen, I, I hope I said his name right. Did I say his name right? You did, yes. Okay. He brought, I watched an interview with him where he was like, just legalize all the drugs. And part of me, like the, you know, the part of me that, that, that grew up hearing, what? Like legalize all the drugs. Part of me was like, what? But another side of me was going, okay, wait, they've done that in... Other countries, of course, I can't think of where off the top of my head right now. Portugal is a great example. Yes. And they showed on W5 that this guy is getting heroin. And this is where I'm going to go with this because I'm conflicted. And then you can yep. tell me about Ground Zero. Um, the, the government, uh, I don't know if it's federal or provincial. I'm not sure. But the government is paying, this, uh, is paying for this one guy's medical grade heroin for uh, three times a day he goes to a government uh, or he goes to a spot I don't know if it's government ran I know it's government funded but yep. uh, and he gets his three doses a day and he's okay and so far he's gotten a job and he's got his own apartment but they have said he's been such a long time user that he's going to be stuck using it for, for, the, for the rest of his life. Yes. So I'm conflicted because why as a government, whether it's federal or provincial, are we paying for this man's habit? But at the same time, I, uh, the part of me that grew up only hearing the two sides of the government is going, okay, wait, if he's getting a job then is that altogether bad? Like, that's why I'm conflicted, and that's why I want your opinion on it. For sure. And and these are the big questions that people aren't asking, and we need to ask these questions, Stephen, or we'll never get to the bottom of yep. what's going on. So there's there's two types of heroin addicts. There's two types of opioid people who are addicted. There's the people who got addicted through injury or through a medical reason where they've now been prescribed these Oxycontins or Percocet or other type of opioid narcotic and they're addicted to them through that and then there's the people who have just experimented through life and they've they've picked up this habit from that and then, and we need to address them as two separate things because they're two different two different realities and there's yeah. two different solutions for these 
So the, the first guy who's been addicted to this opioid through, through medical reasons, we need to maintain him. We've, we've, we've addicted him, we've put him on this drug, and we need to maintain him. Yeah. So I, I, I think we're, we're doing a lot better by giving him a fixed dose that's clean in the hospital or the, in, the, in the pharmacy than we ever could be by making him get it off the street. Yeah. Uh, so that's, that, that would be my justification for allowing him to, to get this dose. Now, if he's working and he's making money, maybe we should charge him for that now that he's... he's or at least he's less than... Right? He's, he's, he's part of the community. Maybe he can pay for that. But the guy who's, who's disadvantaged and hasn't gotten there yet, we should, we should be a little more compassionate about him and, and look after him. Mm -hmm. So, and then now the, there's the person who's gotten addicted through the street. Yeah. I would say four out of five of these people run into opioids because they start smoking cannabis and their dealer, it has what I call the kit. He's got yeah. cannabis, he's got opioids, he's got MDMA, he's got cocaine, he's got the whole kit. So you show up at this guy's house and you'll go and say, hey, you know what, I want a bag of weed. Yeah. And he'll be like, well, you know what, I just ran out, but I got all this other stuff. Yeah. And you might not bite the first time, the second time, but eventually you're going to get curious yeah. and start trying these other things. So we need to get that cannabis away from being a gateway. We need to get that out of their hands and put that into, into dispensaries and, and give people proper access to it and make it safe. And once you do that, you'll see at least 25% of that opioid problem disappear. Yeah. And then from that, we can actually maintain. So now here's why fentanyl is such a problem they're 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 packing this opioid in, in china they're sending it over here and the quality control is almost zero on it yeah so these these pills are having between one dose and a hundred doses of this opioid depending on who packed it and when they packed it yeah so the poor guy on the street thinks he's shooting up one shot of this fentanyl and it's actually like 50 doses of fentanyl yeah and it's killing him right away so that's why we need to get this off. If, if we can get people walking into that drugstore who are addicted to this and taking one clean dose, they won't have to buy the fentanyl. Then the reason they go to fentanyl is it's cheap, but it's a lottery. Yeah. So you get this, this, you're, you're playing Russian roulette every time you buy it. So if we were to, to just get people into the store and getting clean doses, that disappears as well. Mm -hmm. The market goes away. Now where and, also, and you're also making these people a little more accepting to treatment because you're taking the stigma off their head. And that's a huge part of this, too. When you're doing these drugs, society looks down on you so much yep. that this guilt follows you. And you don't want to go for treatment because you don't want to be labeled as this, this addict. Yeah. So these are the things that we need to be doing to, to fix it. I've seen three overdoses in the building. I live here in D.C. in the last two weeks. Mm. Everybody survived, but they... they, they hit their fentanyl and they overdosed and we had to put the naloxone kit on them and get them into the hospital. And I'm in a town of 25,000 people and there's only 33 rooms in this complex that I live in. So you have to understand how big that is. And I'm 10 hours from Vancouver. I'm nowhere near the big city. And it's here. And it's, it's live. And I'm watching it like it's real time in this town. Yeah. So if we don't get a check on this, we're going to create such a problem that we'll never get a handle on it. Yep. Can I... Um... In response to your kit question, because I've thought about this a lot, I did a lot of stupid things when I was younger. I've been, uh, I've been through therapy. I've been through uh, groups. I've been through treatment centers um, because I went through a lot of things in my life. Um, some of them caused by my own stupidity. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna sit there and blame society, but sure. society did have a piece to do with it. It's just yes. not the whole picture. So, um, I will say though, because I, I quit I quit smoking, I quit doing any drug for about, I don't know, five years. Yep. And, then, <clears throat> and then my back really started acting up because of my disability. And I watched what happened with members of my family and Oxycontin and marriages ending and uh, you know, it, it, yeah, the, the things that come with the guilt of the opioid, the alcoholism, and the other, you know, you just you fall into a hole. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, I did start researching cannabis again, and I realized my cannabis issue can't be blamed for the other stupid things I did because, and I, I don't even blame alcohol. To me, it might have fuzzed me up a bit, but deep down, I knew what it, you know. 
Yeah. Uh, for me, it was a it was a mental health issue. But what I'm getting around to is you you brought up the the kit issue. Yeah. And I would like to ask you this question. Like, first of all, um, in your in your younger life, and you could answer me no. It's fine if it's yeah. true or whatever. In your younger life, did you do anything else besides cannabis? I did it all. Okay. So ask yourself a question. Okay. Did you run into the kit problem like you discussed or did think about it. if you were smoking a joint hypothetically and somebody walked in and said yo I got some uh, I got some coke you want to do a line with me most of the time wouldn't most of the time when I thought of it I was like nah I'm good versus if yeah, somebody I, I, and again most of the time yes and it, it started that way I was at parties with and I had a friend, this is how I got introduced to cocaine. I had a friend of mine that I met at a pool hall who had just moved from BC to Ontario. I was living in Toronto at the time. I was actually living in Thornhill. Yeah. And we had pool tables in the basement of the apartment complex that I lived in. Yeah. And I met him there and we were shooting pool and we were having the conversation. And he was like, I'm new to town. I can't find any weed or nothing, right? Yeah. So I, I, had, I had a little bit of hash and I gave him a little bit of hash and said, here you go, smoke this. Yeah. So I, I didn't see this guy for four months. And then I ran into him again in the basement of this building. He's like, oh, you got to come up to my place. So I went up to his house, and he had a whole bunch of cocaine on his table. Yeah. And I didn't, I didn't participate right away. He was still my weed buddy. Yeah. But eventually, because it was in front of me, I started in. Yeah. And it was, it was just because it was there. Yeah. But the question again, it, 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 like I get what you're saying, but what, what, what I'm saying is when, if somebody walked in with a joint, hypothetically, and you smoked it, and, and then offered you a little bit of uh, uh, of coke. Most of the time, in my memory, it would have been like, "No, I'm good." But then, oh, sure. but then, for sure. And, and again, I, if I just smoked that joint, I'm a lot less apt to to pick it up. The, the, okay, the question cool. that so I was you, presenting, or the, the the angle that I was putting on it, is. And sorry, I've seen it here. If someone will walk to their dealer's house with twenty dollars in their pocket, thinking they're going to pick up a couple of grams of pot, and they show up at his house and say, "Hey, look, I'm, uh, can I buy some weed?" and the guy says, "No, I don't have any, yeah. but I have this and this and this and this." Yeah. And I've actually had people in this building come up to me. Now I'm a lot stronger than that, so I would say no. Yeah. But there's addictive personalities out there, and, and people don't have that. A lot of people don't have that filter, and they'll yeah. come to my door and say, "Keith." can you like hand me a bud because I really don't want to go and buy that. And I'm tempted now because I've heard it. I walked away, but I'm, I'm getting the itch to go back and I have no cannabis. And it's, it's just the fact that they put the bug in his head yeah. that he wants to fall into that. So yeah. we can eliminate that problem just by putting cannabis in a dispensary. And it, it's exactly because in my experience, if that same question was presented or that same scenario, and you're you're drinking with the buddy, and that you're drinking, but you're not smoking a joint, and then they go, "Hey, do you want to do a line?" Nine times out of ten, I would say you're like because you're feeling good and you're buzzed. You're like, "Yeah, I'll I'll do a line." Exactly. So I would argue that alcohol is the true gateway drug, not cannabis. And I'll I'll agree with you. And in in social setting, one hundred percent. Yeah. But, uh, and again, it's only in that situation where you show up at your dealer's house looking for cannabis and he doesn't have it. Yeah. We get that a lot in the small town. I don't know how it works in, in Ontario anymore. Uh, it's pretty much the same. So, and they've, they've got everything in their pocket. And if they run out of, out, out of weed, the next thing they do is they want, they want your paycheck. They're, that's their living, is to take your paycheck. We have to understand that that's how, how these street dealers are thinking. They're thinking, this guy gets paid. Every two weeks, then he has $600 expendable. If I get into his pocket early enough, I can get the majority of that money for myself. Yeah. So that's that's the mentality we want to get rid of. And I contend that if you put cocaine in a drugstore and the guy walked in and bought a gram and then he walked back in again and he bought another gram and he showed up for the third gram of cocaine in a night and it had only been five hours since he bought the first two, that pharmacist is going to go, you know what, John? No, I'm not going to sell you that cocaine. It's yeah. going to be no different than the guy at the liquor store. He's going to turn you away. Yeah. And how many bottles of liquor are you really going to get 
after you've been turned away from the store, especially in a town my size, you're not going to walk out the door before the pharmacist is on the phone with the only other drugstore in town saying, don't sell John cocaine. He's a mess. Yeah. You don't have that protection on the street. And even if it's only one thin veil of protection, it's still protection. And we need to be thinking about this as a harm reduction uh, conversation. We need to stop hurting people. We're a better society than that. And, and this punitive attack we have on drug, uh, on drug users is, is insane. Yep. We're not helping people by criminalizing them whatsoever. For uh, one last thing, for for any viewers, because we brought up the other country there, what for any viewers that don't know, what do they do in that other country that we were referring to when it comes oh, to uh, drugs? Yes, yeah, so in, uh, in in Portugal, about sixteen years ago, they they did a study and they had a one percent opioid addiction problem. One in 100 people in the country had an opioid addiction. Yeah. And, and they decriminalized it all. They put it all into the drugstore. So you walk into the drugstore, you can get cocaine, you can get mushrooms, you can get hash, you can get whatever you want. Yeah. And from that, they developed treatment programs for the people who are buying this. And the less disadvantaged ones, they just gave them the drugs so that they could help them get off the street. There is no addiction problem left in Portugal. It is gone. It does not exist. Mm -hmm. They erased their addiction problem by, by decriminalizing drugs. There's wow. people that use, there's people that, that, but it's not a problem. There is no more addiction problem. Those people who are addicted to those opiates are functioning in society, and the ones who just can't quite get their, their, their gears in, in order are looked after. Yeah. Do you have any statistics on if there has been any overdoses in that area or? Oh, there is. Yes. And then there's still people who will overdose, but it's, it's what they're doing is, is they're, uh, they're collecting two or three doses at a time and they're, they're injuring themselves that way. And it's very small and it's usually based so on somebody who's reckless. actually at that point of suicide. The, the overdoses are, are, are just people who've taken that route to kill themselves and, from the studies in Portugal, I don't have it directly in front of me, but the studies they've done is that this the, the suicide rate hasn't gone up and it hasn't really changed. The same people that were killing themselves with drugs before are still killing themselves. It hasn't grown. It hasn't increased. But what has happened is there's no more uh, accidental overdoses. These people are doing it on purpose. Yeah. So they've, they've gotten rid of the accidental overdose deaths, and that, that literally is gone. People do not, uh, unfortunately, overdose. They're doing it on purpose now. Okay. And it's small. It's it hasn't grown. By by legalizing it, that never changed. Do you know do you know when it was legalized? Two thousand and one. And by twenty eleven, within ten years the problem had disappeared. And now it's completely maintained. Everything is under control. The budget has shrunk to the point where it's it doesn't hurt their economy. In the beginning it was a bit of it was a bit of a tough goal because they had to pay a lot of money. It was front end heavy, but it's back end light economically. It was it was worth the money. That, that they spent to fix the problem. Yeah. Now, um, I would say we had a, a, a great interview. Is there anything else that you want to mention? We, we, like I said, we could do a follow up in a couple days too. Sure, you weeks. can. Uh, you can call me anytime, Stephen. All I really want to add to this at the end is that uh, voting is is probably one of our most important rights that we have in this country. Yeah. If you go if you go around and you look at people who come to Canada from the Philippines or they come to Canada from Africa or they come from countries that don't quite have as, as a robust democracy that we have, once they get that citizenship, you will not pry that vote away from them unless you shoot them. You will never get that right from them again. And they exercise it to the maximum degree. So we need to pay attention to that and we need to start getting engaged with who we're electing that is the only way we're going to get pro back to proper governance. And it Actually, doesn't matter yeah. if it's a libertarian or if it's a conservative or it's a liberal or whoever you're looking at, you should be very, very informed as to their policies and, and their principles and who they are as people before you are willing to cast that vote for that person. That's what I want to get out at the end of this, Stephen. Uh, yeah, cool. Um, the, the, actually, you brought up one more question I'm, I'm going to ask you. Sure. What, what do you say to the people that sit there and say, um, what do you sit? Sorry, what do you say to the people that sit there and say, "Well, 
if you vote for anything outside of the liberal, conservative, or NDP, you're throwing away your vote. You're splitting I, the vote. I say that if you think I'm splitting the vote, A, if you, you obviously have no argument because you, can't, you should attack my policies. If I'm stealing votes from your beloved first party, then maybe your party needs to shore up its policies. I'm only stealing votes because people are listening to my message. If my message wasn't ringing true, they wouldn't follow me. Yeah. So your problem with your, your major parties is that your policies fail and people are tired of it. So I'm sorry that you think I'm stealing votes from you. I'm not. I'm giving people an avenue to vote their conscience. They're tired of, your, of, of, of the statist garbage and they've had enough. They're, they're so tired of these political races turning into people flinging poop at each other like monkeys in a zoo. They're done. And I'm seeing it in my riding here right now. People cannot vote Liberal, they will not vote NDP, and I'm, I'm running straight up the middle in this riding. I, I would not be shocked if I finished first or second. I would be quite shocked if I won, but I haven't ruled it out yet. And, and, and for me being as, as intelligent and as pragmatic as I am, Stephen, I don't hold, I don't have these visions of grandeur. I understand what we're up against. Yeah. But there's literally such an avenue running up the middle of people who can't decide that I really think I could take it just on the fact that I'm a principled person, regardless of the party. Yeah. Now, how would someone, or first of all, when is voting day? Uh, voting day is May 9th. We have, uh, we have advanced voting right now up until uh, May 6th. So today and tomorrow you can advance vote at the Eagles Hall. You can advance vote in Cranbrook at the district office on Slater Road. If you need a ride, you can contact me. Uh, I'll give my number. It's 250-421-4637. Give me a call. I'll get you to the ballots. Again, is you don't have cell, to vote by the way? Is that a Go cell ahead, Stephen. Is that a cell phone, by the way? Uh, no, that's my landline. I don't believe in cell phones. That's a whole other uh, conversation we can have another day for half an hour. I don't believe in them. I think they're, uh, they're wrecking society. So I have a landline, and we get back to messages, and we do it that way. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Well, since you gave away your uh, number, I'm going to put it in my phone. <laughs> Please do. Please uh, do. And I, uh, the other thing is, what if someone wants to get involved or wants to learn more about the specifically your BC party? Like, do you guys have a website? Do you we, have a, we have a... Yeah, we have a website. It's libertarian.bc. Ca. From that, there is all of our candidates' list, and there's links to, to contact each one of our candidates on that page. There's some blogs that we've written about uh, current events and things that we believe uh, we should see the government heading in the right direction, so there's lots of conversation going on there. And we are all very approachable. If you send an email off to one of the candidates, they will get back to you as soon as possible. Cool. And what if someone wanted to become a member? Again, that's on uh, libertarian.bc.ca uh, forward slash join. We have a donation page there. We also have a membership page. We're, we're, uh, we're actively seeking members. We're going to start doing pub nights here uh, after the election again. We've kind of put a halt to them now. But uh, if, you, if you get in contact with your, your local candidates, you will see a lot of information. And you can drop your email on the web page, and we'll put you on the mailing list. All right. Cool. I think this is a good way to end it, buddy. I'll reach out to you on uh, on Facebook in a couple of minutes there. Excellent. Thanks again, Stephen, and uh, we appreciate what you're doing out there. Free media and, and alternative media is the way to go, and, and you keep up the good work. Hell, in 10 more years, we're not going to have TV. We're just going to have YouTube and shit like it. So. <laughs> exactly. All right. Later. Take care. Take care. Take care. Take care. Take care. Take care. Take care.